welcome everybody to Coffee with CEF. My name is Katie Kevorkian. I am the Associate Director of Development of the Catholic Education Foundation. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're really grateful for everyone who's joining us today and for everyone who has joined us in the past. If this is the first time you are joining us for Coffee with CEF, welcome. Thank you so much for coming. The Catholic Education Foundation provides tuition awards to thousands of students every year thanks to the support of our donors. We are offering these virtual field trips into our schools to showcase our creative and resilient administrators, teachers, students, and families. If you would like to see more of our schools, you can watch the recordings of our previous seasons at cefdn.org slash coffee with CEF. Right now, I am very, very, very excited to introduce our guests. We have John Rojas, and Alan and Jocelyn from Our Lady of Talpa School in Boyle Heights. John Rojas is the principal of Our Lady of Talpa School in East Los Angeles. John has been a product of Catholic education for most of his life. He attended Our Lady of Guadalupe School in East LA, attended Loyola High School and Marymount, Loyola Marymount University. He began his teaching career at St. Philip the Apostle School in Pasadena. In 2008, he became the eighth grade teacher at Our Lady of Talpa School in Boyle Heights. John became the principal in 2017 when his predecessor, Sister Adela, was appointed to oversee all of the Daughters of Charity schools in the Western province. John, like the Daughters of Charity, believes that Catholic education is the best and only hope for children in underserved communities. One of Our Lady of Talpa's core beliefs is to never turn away a child because their family cannot pay full tuition. Currently, Talpa's enrollment is nearly 300, the highest it's been in 25 years. He strongly believes and cherishes the mission of CEF very deeply. We have two students with us today. Uh, you may recognize them if you attended a couple of our events last year. They were our guest speakers. Alan Lopez is an eighth grade student in Our Lady of Talpa School. He has been recognized as an honored reader, which is an award that the school gives to students who have done an incredible amount of reading in their own time. Alan is an academically gifted young man and Our Lady of Talpa actually had him skip first grade. He's an avid reader, self-taught piano player and a Renaissance man in general. Jocelyn Reyes is also an eighth grade student in Our Lady of Talpa. Jocelyn is a member of Our Lady of Talpa's Vincentian Marian Youth, which is a service and prayer group devoted to living out the St. Vincent, Vincent's charism of service towards others. Jocelyn and the other members of the Vincentian Marian Youth Group have made meals for the homeless, organized drives to provide our homeless brothers and sisters with much needed items. Most importantly, the visit, the visit and interaction with those they serve, recognizing they are children of God. She is one of Talpa's top students and a member of nearly every sports team. Er, thank you all for joining us this morning. We are going to break with tradition because we have a really special gift for everyone from Alan. Alan is here with his piano and he is going to provide a live musical performance. From Boyle Heights, Los Angeles, here is Alan. <laughs> Thank you. 
Wow. I invite everybody to unmute and for a round of applause. Thank you. Bravo. Well done. Bravo, bravo. Indeed. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Alan. That was absolutely beautiful. So now I would like to ask my first question to all three of you. So what are you drinking this morning and what's in your cup? I brought my CEF mug today and I have coffee. So Alan, what do you have to drink today? Um, today I have a caramel coffee and it's in a mug that I got from Toronto. Oh, that's cool. And Jocelyn, what have you got? Um, I have in a white mug just a normal everyday cup of coffee. And Mr. Rojas, John, what have you got? I have uh, my Raider, my Raider mug. We've fallen on tough times lately. And I have a little bit of coffee with mostly coffee meat. That's my, it's <laughs> just a splash of coffee. Well, cheers, guys. Thank you so much for being here this morning. It's really, really wonderful to see you. All right. And so now, now I've got some of the, uh, some of the more hard hitting questions for you. I'd love it if you could tell us about your school and, and community. For those of us who've never been to Our Lady of Talpa School or Boyle Heights or East Los Angeles, can you give us a little bit of history, please? I'd love to. Um, really, our school is the dream of Father Jose Severa. So Father Severa was a Vincentian priest from Europe, and he was missioned here in Boyle Heights in the 40s. And right at the turn of the 40s, the, the community was just like it is now. It's an underserved community. It's a, it's a working class community. And he really, it was his dream to have a parish school for the children. The problem, only a couple of problems, he had no money and uh, he had no teachers, but that didn't stop them. He was really a visionary. So um, his first idea was to kind of reach out to his sister, his sister uh, religious order. So they have the Vincentian priest and for the sisters, it's the Daughters of Charity. So the Daughters of Charity were at that time stationed in Missouri, and he wrote them a quick little letter. You know, it's my dream. I'm going to start a school in the next a year or two. Would you please staff the school? And then that way we can have a Vincentian community here. The uh, Mother Superior of the Daughters of Charity politely replied, you know, that's a wonderful, a wonderful plan. Unfortunately, we simply don't have the sisters to, uh, to staff the school. But I wish you well, and, you know, we'll keep it, we'll keep you in our prayers. And he just, he wouldn't leave it alone. He just said, well, will you at least pray on it? And she promised him to pray on it. So with that polite decline, that didn't stop him. So we have, we reached deep into the vault. That didn't stop him. He dug into the, adja the adjacent lot next to the church. It's a, it's a hill. And uh, the school legend is that it was uh, really a, a dump site. People just had, used to dump their trash there. In the excavation process, they removed a car that had been kind of buried there over some time. And uh, he transformed this dump uh, into the beginnings of a school. And he was really a hands-on uh, hands pastor. He didn't have really funds to do it. So he reached out to his community because the children, uh, the parents uh, wanted their children to attend a Catholic school. Um, he, he even had um, one, of the, one of the parish families had, I think, seven children. And the husband and wife both wanted their children to come to a Catholic school. They, they uh, gave their wedding rings uh, to Father Severa. And he, they, he was able to sell them uh, to fund the construction. And he, again, he was a visionary. It wasn't just a single a single story Catholic school. He built a three story building, the bottom of which has a auditorium slash gymnasium. So you see him there. And these are the beautiful pictures of him. He was really hands on. So there he's laying the foundation. And there you could kind of see just how big a project this was. This was, uh, you know, a big project in the 50s, especially when when money was was quite limited. So still, the problem is that the, the school's being built. But who's going to staff the school? Well, the Daughters of Charity, even though they had, they had not committed to staffing the school, they had a, a, a orphanage uh, here in Boyle Heights and they had their sisters staff that orphanage. And the, the local sisters here in Boyle Heights uh, informed Father Severa, hey, you know, the Mother Superior, she's gonna be doing a visit, she wants to see it. She's gonna be coming on this day and on this time if you wanna kind of meet her in person. So Father Severa, uh, being, being the, the, the smart person he was, he got the local children, which would have been the kindergartners. He dressed them up in a school uniform 
uh, he prepped them, had them sing, practice songs, and each, each had them with flowers. So he had them waiting outside of the, the local orphanage. And when the mother superior visited, as soon as she got off their car, um, they started singing to her, uh, singing songs to her. They gave her the flowers. And uh, at that moment, she promised she didn't know how she was going to staff it, but, but she promised she would. And uh, a year later, there we have the, the school. And it opened up, I think it was on September 9th, 1951. It only opened up from grades K through four. So we just opened up with uh, up to fourth grade. And with that being said, even though it was only up to fourth grade, the first day had 256 students. It was uh, at least 40, sometimes 50 in every single classroom. And then we have a picture here of the original sisters that were here, really the pioneers. And so since 1951, the Daughters of Charity have been here. They're still here. We still have uh, five sisters uh, living on site on the campus. And uh, two of them are still involved in the school. One of them is serves as my mentor and just my, my go-to person because she just has a wealth of experience. She's in her 80s. And we also have a bookkeeper who's a daughter of charity and she's 93 years old and still keeps a, a pencil and paper ledger. So we have a rich tradition. So almost 70 years now, 70 years of the Daughters of Charity being a part of this school and a part of this parish. Thank you, John. Those were, pictures were awesome. I love the sisters' habits from back then. Those were some great, yeah, those are some great habits. Well, thank you for showing us those. Very, very cool. Um, so my next question is, John, um, after speaking to you earlier this week, I feel like your school year started off really, really strong. So can you tell us about distance learning and how your classes are structured and what you're doing this fall to um, offer this, uh, offer a really strong education for your students? We were really blessed at the beginning of this year um, to receive really two, uh, two investments and two char charitable gifts, one from the Archdiocese and the other from uh, Mr. and Mrs. Shea and Shea Family Charities. So, um, and really at the beginning of the year, we had um, one iPad uh, with built-in Wi-Fi for every single one of our students. So we went from, from basically, you know, kind of scavenging. We had students at the end of last year on their cell phones, um, doing what they could, or some students not having access at all. So we'd kind of figure out how we can uh, maneuver. And then uh, again, the, the, the C, through C3 and through uh, the generous donation of Mr. and Mrs. Shea, every student at the beginning of this year has an iPad with built-in Wi-Fi. So right now, um, we, our first day was August uh, 19th. Even our four-year-olds, our TKers and our kindergartners are on Zoom. We've managed to teach them how to do it um, using a, you know, a, a, the latest uh, kind of software and some careful planning and thought and design. So even our, our four-year-olds log in every day for about two and a half hours on Zoom and um, they log in on their own for the most part. So it's a matter of a push of a button, it opens right up. And uh, it's been really a, a, a very successful year We're so far, knock on wood. And um, attendance is great. And really it's just a, a, a due to the, the generosity of our benefactors, the dedication of teachers and, and working along with uh, with our parents. We're very blessed. So my next question is for uh, Jocelyn and Alan. You're both doing really well in your classes, despite some challenges, of course, with distance learning. So I would love it if you could tell us about what you're doing in class. If you could tell us about some of the ways that your teachers are engaging you from a distance and some of the kind of softwares and programs that you guys are using to learn. Um, Jocelyn. Yes. Uh, one of the two main softwares we use are called Canvas and Freckle. Canvas is a web-based learning management system. It is used by our educators and students where they can keep track and access all assignments with the touch of a button. Canvas keeps everything well organized and is generally easier if we had to keep our assignments in our folders or in our backpacks. The way it works is that a teacher submits an assignment in which we must do by a certain date and a certain time. Once we've done that, you click submit and it'll automatically go to the teacher, which makes it easier for her to grade. Then we have Freckle. Freckle is an online learning platform for grades kinder through 12 that addresses many standard-based skills and concepts. Freckle adapts to each student, giving them the appropriate challenge to succeed and become a stronger student. We also use Pear Deck, which we primarily use in our math classes where our teacher creates a uh, slideshow presentation. And basically uh, us through uh, online, we go to a website, enter a code, and we can see her presentation without her having to show us herself. And then uh, there's also interactive uh, 
slide with it where you can write your answers if she wants us to warm up before class or um, if how we're feeling, like you can slide uh, a little uh, blue uh, symbol to show if you're feeling uh, you understand, you need a bit of help or you don't understand. And then finally, we use this app called Achieve 3000, which we primarily use in our language arts class. And uh, in Achieve, we there's these articles uh, for any topic really. And uh, before reading the article, we answer this question and answer why we chose it as kind of before on your own opinion, what you know of the topic, we read the article, we have an activity with questions about the article. And then afterwards, we answer the same question at the beginning, but now that we have more knowledge, we can answer it more with facts rather than opinion. That sounds great. Um, so how do you, are you enjoying using these platforms, Alan, to learn? I would say it's easier to turn in assignments uh, because before like we had to wait until the next day to go turn it in uh, like at the teacher's desk. But now once we click submit on Canvas, like Jocelyn said, it goes straight to the teacher. It's much easier to uh, submit assignments. And, uh, and Jocelyn, are you, how are you enjoying school? Uh, I enjoy it very well. I like Alan says, the assignments to turn in are much easier. If I would have had it in my backpack or if it's due in a few days, it's impossible to keep track of every single class, especially with everything cramped up in the backpack. So like I said, with the push of a button, it makes it so much more easier and not only for us, but for the teacher. Since some, I know some worksheets for teachers can get lost all the time. And I guess it's just there for them and it's easier for both teachers and students. You can't, you can't blame the, you can't say the dog ate your paper anymore. So, um, John and Alan, Jocelyn as well, but I want to hear from John first. What are some of the challenges that you're facing this year and how are you working to improve? You know, I, I would say the biggest challenge is, um, you know, we, we kind of reached out, our, reached out to our parents and, and, and met with them and kind of uh, talked about what would make for a successful distance learning um, environment. And one of, the, one of the things we kind of recommend is having a quiet space for your child that's kind of assigned. They have everything where they can, um, everything at their disposal and um, free of distractions. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, we have some, we have some large families in very small uh, apartments. So, you know, we're ideally, you'd say, well, you know, maybe they can have the child just kind of at the, at the dining room table, whether it's quiet. But for, for uh, many of our families, you have, you know, four or five children in a one or two bedroom apartment. So, you know, you'll have one child in here, one this part of the living room, another child at the other part of the living room, and you know, they're kind of um, echoing off of each other. So one of the ways we've tried to address that is by making sure uh, we can provide um, those families with the headphones and and just kind of a quiet space if possible. That's the that's the hardest part at this point. In on um, Alan and Jocelyn, um, I hope I would love it if you guys could talk about some of the social emotional strategies for the classrooms and the mood meters. Alan, you were telling me about these before. Yes, so at the beginning of every class, um, our teacher, in, uh, she asks us how we're feeling. And so before the school year started, we were given colored cards. Um, I, it's red, green, orange, blue, and yellow. And depending on how you feel, the best being yellow and the worst being red. So she knows how, how to, like she knows how you're feeling, if you're feeling aggravated or maybe happy and energized. And then also in our language arts class, she gives us a list of words. And then in the chat box, we uh, tell her two of the words from the list of how we're feeling. So like she knows how we're, like, how we're feeling so she can uh, try to make it the best learning experience for us. Jocelyn, what are some of the um, strategies that teachers use that are helpful to you? I guess, uh, yeah, like Alan said, in the mornings where they check in on the students, it really helps lean into towards the classroom environment, how she can provide better ways to help them teach as if they're having a bad day. And I guess she just can tell how good of a student they're gonna be. Not only that, but on Fridays, we have these with two teachers uh, where they come in and help us with coping mechaniz mechanisms for our, towards our emotions. For example, if we're feeling angry or we're just feeling sad or more emotional, she gives us this mechanism in order to, or like these breathing exercises that help us calm down and stay focused. Uh, not only that, but she has us, um, how do you call it? 
She has us look at examples of how a student's feeling and we have to give ideas and examples of what they can do to be get better um, and why exactly they would feel that way and what they can do to keep learning even if they're feeling the same. That was, that was one of the things that we really were um, intentional about at the beginning of the year was recognizing that we as adults, you know, living through this pandemic and, and being isolated really from many of the friends, friends and family that we, um, that sustain us and give us energy, but that, that causes anxiety and stress and um, just an, a general uneasy feeling. And so if we recognize that as adults that we were going through this, we wanted to be able to um, A, recognize that children were going through this as well, often much more so, and then how could we support them and, and kind of uh, giving them strategies to, to A, acknowledge how they're feeling and recognize what's causing me to feel this way. Because sometimes, you know, school can um, be the, the outlet for one's frustrations, but really recognizing what is causing these, um, these feelings of anxiety or even loss because they haven't seen their friends now in almost half a year. And then coping with that. And because ultimately we need, um, we need the heart and the mind to be open to be able to, to, to learn. I heard you just had an eighth grade retreat recently. Um, Jocelyn, can you tell us about the retreat? Yes, in that retreat, most of the class came together at the auditorium of our school. Uh, we all got to see each other, which was pretty much like really fun since we haven't seen each other in a while. We played a bunch of teamwork games, for example, these relay races against each other. I guess that brought us more, more together since we haven't seen each other. We got to interact with each other as well as a game of volleyball. We know our class is very competitive and well, everyone loves volleyball. So I guess that was fun too. The adoration after happened right after that. And I guess it gave us, it did give us a motivation because we had something to be thankful for that we got to see each other once again, that no one was hurt or no one was gone. Uh, and then we got to eat, which also was also pretty fun since we were tired. And I'd say it was a memorable moment after everything that's been going on. Mr. Rojas, could you tell us a little bit how you organized a retreat with eighth graders and how you made it safe? So what we did is, you know, we, we did our, before anybody came in, we had to screen them. We did uh, the, the touchless uh, thermometers. And then what we did is, um, like for a volleyball game, so we had, um, we had uh, kind of chairs socially distanced around the court and we had the six on each side and um, we got we got a number of brand new clean volleyballs and they would start a volley and go back and forth and once that rally was over we put in a brand uh, brand new clean um, volleyball took that one out sanitized it came back on in um, lunch we um, lunch we had we have a thank thank goodness we have a, a nice uh, gymnasium so we had six foot tables and every student got their own table. We were, we were distance, you know, as, as more than six feet and just uh, taking the precautions um, that, that, you know, just frequent hand washing, hand sanitizing. And uh, luckily we have an outdoor area for church. We were able to again, socially distance and spend some time in prayer with the Eucharist exposed. And um, really that's how we ended our day and then followed by lunch. And it was, it was really a nice day to kind of build community and, and be together. Um, and the kids, I think, really enjoyed it. Now, I have a question from the audience. Um, this one's for Jocelyn. Um, Jocelyn, the, your bio says you're an athlete. So the question is, how has being an outstanding athlete helped you understand the importance of teamwork and leadership? Um, I guess it helps me understand because I know that I can't have a problem with any of the teammates once I step onto the court. After all, it's not just a one person playing the game. It requires all of us to work together for example, we need the setter, the libero, the middle blocker, and they all rely on each other for the team to be structured well and be able to fight against any opponent. Thanks, Jocelyn. We're all here because we care about Catholic education. We care about your students and we want the best for the students of Los Angeles. So how is it that we can help you ha have this excellent education and these activities and this faith-filled um, experience for the students? Well, it starts off just with your continued support of, of CEF. So we have um, uh, 296 students here at Our Lady of Telpa, and it goes back to what I think we, we began with, um, that we, we don't turn away anybody because they can't afford to pay full tuition. So we will figure it out. And part of that figuring it out comes with the generous support of CEF. So we have approximately 122 of our students receive CEF and uh, that allows us to kind of uh, bridge the gap 
And um, so we're grateful for CEF. Please continue to support them because they, without them, our, our job would be nearly impossible. The other is I'd, I'd invite you to look at our school's website, our lady of And we have a, uh, uh, an opportunity to, to really give and, and continue this mission. And it's a very special mission. It's the mission of the Daughters of Charity. And you can see it right there. And uh, we really believe that every child uh, has a right to a Catholic education. And, um, and we, we won't turn away anybody and, and God will provide and God has provided. And thank you, Katie, for showing that. So uh, we'd be really grateful. Yes, that's uh, the link can be found at Our Lady of Talpa School.org. So if you are able to support Our Lady of Talpa, you can visit them there and learn more about the Daughters of Charity as well. Alan and Jocelyn, I've got another question for you. Where will you be applying for high school and what schools are your top choices? Alan? Um, for, for me, my top choice would be Loyola High School. Um, and I would say a close second would be Bosco Tech. And why, why do you choose Loyola or Bosco? What, do, what is it that you like about those schools? Um, because my uh, cousin, he goes to Loyola Marymount uh, University. So I, I feel like I should kind of follow in his steps and go to Loyola High School. And uh, Bosco Tech, they're just like an amazing school. Uh, I, and, uh, and of course they're Catholic, Catholic education. So yeah, I think that's what really persuaded me to pick those two. And Jocelyn, what schools are you looking at? Uh, right now, my top choice is Flint Ridge Sacred Heart Academy, but as well, I am also looking forward into Immaculate Heart or Bishop Amalt High School. And what about those schools um, are you, are interest you? Again, the Catholic education is, it's like very important to me. Um, and I'd say I really like how the schools look. Um, it's a place I'd want to be. I Something I would enjoy being over there. That's probably what I'd like because... I have to go to a school that I like. If not, well, then that's not that great. Well, thanks, guys. Well, so yeah, they're in eighth grade. So this is the year that they'll be applying. And so we wish you the best of luck with that. Why is going to a Catholic school important to you? Um, for me, it's important because uh, most kids that uh, don't go to a Catholic school never really learn about Christ and the life he lived, all his saints. They don't really learn about that stuff. Uh, if they don't really go to a Catholic school. And I feel like it's very important for, at a young age, children to learn about the life that he led, how he led it, all his saints. I, I, re I really think that's important for an education. And what about you, Jocelyn? Why is going to a Catholic school important to you? Uh, because I've always been a Catholic student since, uh, well, since forever. And I feel like the Catholic church, it does adapt to the people's morals. And I guess it helps them become a better person where they can divide what's right and what's wrong. And it just overall helps them become a better person because they like to follow in God's footsteps. And that's something that's very important to become an excellent person. And Jocelyn, you're in the um, Venetian Marian youth group. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes, like Mr. Roja said earlier, there is a bunch of students that uh, well, we did like this little audition to see how we would qualify to get in there. We had the perfect traits or characteristics. And a lot of us, we really enjoy helping out the people that are in most need, even more than other people. And it just, it's a beautiful feeling knowing that I can do something to help everyone else out there. Can I expand on that, Katie? So it goes back to our, our charism of being a Daughters of Charity in a Vincentian school. Um, that charism is, is really the first thing, the foundation of everything we do. Um, and so the, 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 the Vincentian Marian uh, youth group goes back to St. Catherine Labore and her, her visit with the Miraculous Medal and the Blessed Mother. And the Blessed Mother said, I want a group for, for, for my children. And so that's the, the basically the beginnings of the Vincentian Marian youth group. And they, they have done some really wonderful work. It's, it's service and prayer. And uh, before the pandemic hit, what they were, the, our VMY group, VMY for short, partnered with Showers of Hope. And Showers of Hope is a nonprofit that kind of had these um, portable, uh, uh, on, on wheel facilities where um, our homeless brothers and sisters could shower and just kind of take care of the, their basic necessities. And so before they kind of got on site, our VMY would, would make uh, lunches and sandwiches for them and, and give it to them. And um, we started off actually just doing, doing kind of like blanket and sock drives, but instead of just kind of getting them and just dropping them off at a local, local organization, um, the teachers um, 
and some of the students from VMY, we would on a Friday after school, we would go down uh, to behind Oliveira Street and, and, and give them out um, personally uh, to those, those in need and, and really interact with them and, and treat them as, as human beings and as individuals. And one of the things that struck us was um, we made repeated visits and we would you know see the, see the same people and meet them and greet them and shake their hands. And then we'd come back a week or two later and say, hi, hi Jim, how are you doing? And I remember this one gentleman in particular because the children remembered their names. He was so struck that, that you, you remember my name um, because often they're separated for their families for a number of reasons and they just become, uh, they, they kind of lose their identity. And so the fact that the children met with them, remembered their name, greeted them, I mean, they were, it, it, they, 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 re, re, they regain their humanity in, in a sense. And it was really, I think it helped them, but additionally it helped our children kind of be, be Christ to somebody and recognize um, the Christ, that Christ resides in the poor as well. A question for Jocelyn and Alan. I'll, I'm gonna ask you, Alan, first. Um, what is it that you like best about Our Lady of Telpa School? Um, for me, what I like best is like Ms. Rowe has said, they, they would never turn down a student if they couldn't pay tuition. And I think the teachers are always very nice and friendly. And just overall, uh, the education here that they teach to us is amazing. Like uh, the Catholic uh, religion classes are amazing. They teach us a lot of important stuff that we need to know in math class. Like they, they uh, use very good teaching methods that uh, are really hands-on for the students. And Jocelyn? Uh, what I like most about the school is how strongly they value the education for every student, um, how they're constantly trying to do everything in their power to create the better environment for the students where they can learn and adapt, like Alan said, hands-on learning. And it just gives them this hope for students to want to do it more and more. And I guess we owe it all to them. Uh, so we have to thank them for all they do so that we can keep learning. Thank you, Alan and Jocelyn. Now that we are um, staying at home and doing school from home, what do you guys like to do for fun? Alan, what do you, what do, you do for fun? Um, for me, for fun, I usually, I mostly watch movies with my family, and also uh, I, play, I play a lot of video games with my friends from school, like we talk online, so it's, it's good to have sort of like not losing all the so, uh, social life, like I still have like a nice social life with my friends because I'm able to talk to them online, like through Zoom, through other apps, so I think it's really cool that uh, video games and stuff uh, can connect uh, people like that, including me and my classmates. And what about you, Jocelyn? Uh, kind of the same as Alan. I've been watching a lot of Netflix, that's for sure. I've been watched like 16 season shows already. Um, and I guess, yeah, video games as well, but I'm not very good at them, but I guess it's really fun since I get to talk to them and like, we're all working together and like, it's nice to hear them talking again and we're just laughing at each other because like some of, someone got knocked down or someone's like all alone in the middle of nowhere. I guess that's like a memorable moment too. I've got, oh, now I have lots of questions from the audience. So um, I think uh, for this one will be for you, John. How, how large are, what are your class sizes? How large are your classes? We are, we are very nearly fully enrolled. So I think our eighth grade class is our smallest class and they have 24. Uh, every other class is, it has at least 30. So we, we try to put our cap at 35. And for the most part, uh, we're, we're there. So we even have some weight, we have some wait lists in some classes, but we're very blessed. Um, and then we really feel like, it, we really feel like this is a transformative education and it was a life-changing education. And so it's kind of hard for me as an, as an administrator to say, well, no, we're gonna cap it at 30 and um, turn away five students who, um, from this opportunity. And it's even hard now, like at 35, which is our kind of our, our hard cap. I mean, I still get 36. I still get, you know, an, another applicant or two and it's very, very hard to turn away, but we just, we lack the physical space to take anymore, but we're very blessed to be very nearly fully enrolled. Um, so how do students interact virtually as a school? Do you have school masses? Are there school families? What are you doing to connect students together? We have um, every Friday, we have an assembly where we um, pray together, where we acknowledge everybody's birthday and we spotlight them. I mean, all 300, nearly 300 students are in the same Zoom room together. We spotlight, uh, unfortunately for them, I sing happy birthday to them and we spotlight that. We also have adoration and um, and just different forms of prayer. We, we do that every Friday to kind of bring that community, bring the bring everybody together as a Telpa community. Now we have um, some folks here from Art Trek um, and we're wondering 
if uh, uh, Jocelyn or Alan, have you been doing any of the art activities in the art bags? Um, yes, so um, mostly on Fridays, it's a kind of a less academic day. Um, sometimes our teacher, uh, she uh, uh, has a time where we take out stuff from our art bag and then do some projects that were in the bag, like the instructions. And most recently, uh, what we did was we got, we um, uh, drew a, a bubble letter of our first initial and then a quote uh, from a saint around it, Saint Therese, uh, around the bubble letters and kind of show uh, what it means to us. So yeah, that, that's our most recent. How about you, Jocelyn? Have you, how have you enjoyed the art lessons? Uh, I really do enjoy the art lessons because it gives us a time to think to ourselves. Like they're more of a recognizing how you're feeling, like the way Alan said it, how we did the bubble letter and writing a quote and a saying. Um, we had to kind of meditate and have a time to ourselves to be able to answer what what that saint really meant, since we know it wasn't a direct words that what, what her words meant. And so it was like where I had to think to myself and have this quiet area where I can be able to, to think and overall just like have time to myself. Um, so Alan and then Jocelyn, but what are you con what are you considering now for maybe a future career that you might want to have? What are you thinking about? What kind of field are you thinking about going into? <sighs> Um, for me, I'd say most likely the one that I, I would enjoy the most is maybe um, being a, a video game designer or maybe a, a movie editor because I, I do, I, I kind of know how to edit. I've been kind of practicing uh, editing videos to see if maybe it could be a career choice for me. And also uh, um, video game design because I, I've also been trying to, you know, code like little, just little things like just to try it out to see if maybe it could be a future career choice for me. For me, uh, I'd say I'd want to be a cardiothoracic surgeon or uh, anesthesiologist. I really like heart surgery. I like thinking on my feet. I hate like standing still. Like if a trauma came in, I like running in, having to think on the spot in every possible way to save them. I guess it's something I really enjoy doing. And if not, if it's not the that I say a lawyer I love arguing with people it's I love proving them wrong no matter how much they think they're right especially when they think they're right and then the moment of realization on their face or they're like oh wow she's right <laughs> I guess I really love arguing with them <laughs> those are two excellent career choices um so we're um I have a someone. I have a question for someone that said, "What do you see yourself doing five years from now?" So five years from now, you'd be starting college, I guess, or taking some time between high school and college. Where do you, are you? Have you looked at colleges? Where do you think you would want to go to college, Jocelyn? I didn't really look at college yet. I'd say I looked at university. I really like Oxford University. I guess I just like how it's structured, how it looks. Again, something I would enjoy. But in five years from now, I, I'd expect myself, or yeah, I expect myself to be on the way to success. And what about you, Alan? So for me, I would say maybe uh, Loyola Marymount University or UCLA, um, because I, I don't want to be too far from home. You know, like I, I do get homesick a lot when I like travel. Um, so I don't want to, and I also know my parents would miss me go, gone for four years somewhere like in um, New York and stuff. And like, if I were to go somewhere on the East Coast, I feel like, uh, I don't know, I don't think I could, I could do it. I don't know. I, I get really homesick. And so I feel like Loyola is a good, uh, is a good university. My, uh, my uh, cousin went there, he went to Loyola. Um, and then my uncle also went to UCLA. He uh, got a scholarship there, so. Wow, so you guys, you guys have great plans already. Um, what? Um, so, Jocelyn, you're an athlete. So, how are you keeping up with your athletic training at home? Um, I haven't really done much of the athletic training. I guess sometimes I do go run to keep a bit in shape, although that's not really doing much since I don't do it often. But when I do, I like to do that, like super early in the morning. Uh, I did start volleyball again. I started training again uh, on my receipts uh, so I can like change the trajectory to the setter position. That's something I really did focus on more. 
but I feel like it's kind of hard with the pandemic because I can't work with my team anymore at all. And I can't see where I need to adjust myself to help them or something. I guess that's mostly the problem I have. I have a comment and a question uh, for Mr. Rojas. So, and a compliment for you guys. Uh, you, you are great Telfa ambassadors. You are articulate and self-confident. Mr. Rojas, what is your plan for sustainability in these challenging economic times? Well, we've really, um, luckily prior to this pandemic, we really um, focused very much on, on increasing our capacity for development. Uh, we've reached out to our alumni and have a, 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 a database there that we've reached out and have an annual giving campaign. Um, and really, I, I think what has helped us um, be sustainable and kind of reach this point where we're at is um, the fact that we were able to kind of change the narrative in terms of Catholic education. Where I think there's this um, kind of belief that maybe the numbers, it's, it's uh, an institution that uh, isn't sustainable um, or that the numbers are decreasing. I mean, I think we went up, we, we enrolled 10 more students this year. Uh, our enrollment went up 10 more than it was last year. And I think having that narrative and, 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 and that belief that we will, we will accept every, any child regardless of their ability to pay um, full tuition um, has really helped um, uh, support us. And, and it's attracted a number of benefactors that, that really believe in that mission. And, and also with, with the, uh, uh, the, the aid and support of the Daughters of Charity, I think is, is really uh, a, a true, true blessing. All right, I have a question for you, John. Um, are, is the school going to be applying for the waiver for TK through two that's available? And um, and I, I I I honestly don't know the answer to this question. Is a, is the Archdiocese of Los Angeles Department of Catholic Schools recommending that the schools apply for the waiver? And if you could tell us more about that. Sure. So even before the, the uh, there's kind of like a three step process. So the first step was a cohort. Um, where you could kind of have a group of 12 students here. And that started, I think, about three weeks ago. And so we um, really knew that there were some children in our school who were um, uh, really home alone because their parents were considered essential workers. They had, you know, uh, we have one family in particular who has six children here uh, from a single mother, and she's working during the day. So she had a four-year-old, a five-year-old, all the way to eighth grade, and nobody there to support the distance learning needs. So what we did is we kind of applied for this first process, which is a cohort. And so myself and uh, my fellow vice principal who's here, I think in the meeting, uh, watched, watched the children here during the day from nine, nine till about one. And we helped facilitate making sure they have their headphones on, making sure they're logged in. So that was the first step we took a part, we're, we're a part of right now, kind of identifying which students really were needed, needed the most assistance. Um, the waiver process, I think we're, there's a meeting going on right now for the waiver process. And we are looking into bringing in at least first our TKers, um, because distance learning is, is most difficult for four-year-olds. Um, it looks like the rules right now, you can only have 12, uh, 12 people at a time. We're, we're waiting for the details to kind of fully emerge, but it's something we're gonna pursue for our TKers in particular. And I think uh, the cap, the, certainly the Department of Catholic Schools is really pushing that. I think it's, it's wise to um, really look at the waiver process as uh, a means to get ready for the eventual return. And, um, I think if, if a school is, is gonna, let's say in January or November, all of a sudden uh, the Department of Health says, yeah, you can, you can bring back all your students. Um, just learning from the, the, the cohort protocols, there's a lot of rules and regulations. And so I think kind of starting off with a cohort, then bringing in a grade or two kind of gives us practice on how to make sure the protocols and the coordination with the Department of Health um, is gonna unfold slowly as opposed to just saying, well, all of a sudden we're gonna invite all, all our school back and figure it out here with half, half the school here at a time. Or, um, so yeah, we're gonna be pursuing that, especially right now, it's only open for TK through second. We're gonna start it off with TK and the Department of, of Catholic Schools are really being supportive in that process. Um, Alan and Jocelyn, do you, have, do you have any siblings at home that you have to um, help with schoolwork and how, how is it going? How about you, Alan? Yeah. Yeah, I have one sibling, but uh, she's in uh, second grade, so she's still trying to get used to uh, going on Zoom because before, for I think it was uh, TK through third grade, they had pre-recorded videos for their classes, and so it was kind of hard for uh, my little sister to, you know, get on there. So I, every day uh, back uh, last school year, I had to go help her get on the videos because they were pre-recorded. But now uh, in this school year, everyone's on Zoom. 
but it is still a challenge to, um, you know, help her put in the code and uh, the password and have her sign in. So it is still a challenge, but it's much easier through Zoom. You're a good big brother. And what about you, Joss? Uh, I don't have any siblings that still do Zoom, but I do have my sister's daughter. And well, she's like five years old. And sometimes my mom has like these technical difficulties all the time. And I have to stop my class and I run over to her. She's like, Jocelyn, Jocelyn, I need your help. And I come running. And then sometimes if she's not there, like if she has something important to do, I watch her for a little bit, but I guess it's impossible. It's a challenge with her. Cause like, she really likes to get up and leave in the middle of class. And like, she likes talking back to her teacher sometimes. Like she'll say something, she's like, no, I don't want to do it. I guess that's also challenging, but it's, it's getting better. Yeah, it's gotta be hard when you're five. Thank you, but you sounds like you have a lot of patience and it's really great that you're able to get all of your work done and do so well, even when both of you, even when you are responsible for helping out other people with their own work. That's, a, you're doing a great job. John, did you say you do have a cohort of 12 in school right now? Yes, we do. So yes. how is that How is that set up right now? So right now we have, um, we have 12 people in our uh, auditorium and so, we have, they're at, they're at their desk. I mean, I think the desks are about eight to 10 feet apart because just the, the auditoriums or the gym is really large. Um, when they first come in, we ask them the, the CDC sc screening questions. We take their temperature, we keep a log of it. Once, once we clear them for uh, entrance, they come on in, they sit at their table. Everybody has headphones on so that way they're, the sound's not bouncing off one, one uh, bouncing off each other's iPad. And, um, we have one student go to the restroom at a time. They hand sanitize before, they hand sanitize back. Um, they take, we have little snacks for them during their breaks. Everybody stays at their, at their desk. And then uh, at lunchtime, they go back home, but it's working out really well. And these were students who really like four and five were home alone with si older siblings. And just the older siblings were so focused on their own class and rightfully so that they were just not showing up. So it's, it's really um, had a dramatic impact for our most vulnerable students. And so we're really thrilled to do it. All right. Well, thank you very much. I also, I want to thank John and Jocelyn and Alan for coming here today, but there's two other people I really want to thank. I want to thank um, Colleen Welsh and Colleen Ruhan. Uh, Colleen Ruhan unfortunately had to get called into an emergency board meeting and couldn't be here today, but she's really looking forward to the recording. But thank you to both Colleen's for helping out with this episode and inviting your friends and encouraging people to come learn about Talpa because it's a great place and I'm always excited to talk about it and show the amazing things that you're doing. If you can give um, to CEF, 100% of your donations um, will, will support tuition assistance. So all of our teachers and our principals and our pastors and everybody who's working for our schools is doing their best to make sure that no one gets turned away for lack of funds. And we are, and CEF is working really hard to make sure that everybody who qualifies can get a, the financial aid needed to go to a Catholic school. So if you can give, please visit cefdn.org to donate to the tuition awards program. And 100% of your contribution funds financial assistance for the neediest students in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. This is my last coffee with CEF, as I mentioned last week. Oops. Uh, next week, we will have a retrospective episode to see a where are they now from some of the guests who were um, who were on the show in sp in the spring. So we're looking forward to that. And um, Johnny, Katie, yeah, Katie, Katie. Before yes. we all okay, go, stop. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Katie for bringing this experience to life for us every Wednesday morning for the last several months giving us something wonderful to look forward to, to learn from, and to take away with us, and bringing to us all of our wonderful Catholic schools, all of our partners, all of the people who help make Catholic education here in the LA Archdiocese. We are so sad to see her go. We wish her so much luck at Flintridge Sacred Heart Academy where she will be taking the helm 
as Director of Advancement. And we're going to do our very best to continue to carry this forward in a way that will make you all want to come back every week and hear more about our wonderful Catholic schools. So with that, I would love to give a round of applause and a huge thank you to Katie for all that she has done for us. Thank you all. All right, I'll turn it back to Katie to close. Thank you all for your kind comments. Um, it has been a blessing to have this opportunity to be at the Catholic Education Foundation and to be able to um, to truly to make lemonade out of a terrible situation with COVID-19 and be able to, um, you know, create this program for all of our students. So, um, and to support our schools. So I hope you all will continue to watch Coffee with CEF. Um, Johnny will be taking over the responsibilities as host. And I know that it's going to continue to be the vibrant, good news filled show every Wednesday morning that you've all come to look forward to. And I will truly, truly miss seeing you all every Wednesday. Thank you. Katie, I do have to say some large shoes to fill and I don't think we're gonna fill them, but wow, what a great blessing it's been don't every single week. tell me my week. shoes are large, John. <laughs> we're gonna do our best. No, we're gonna do we're our gonna, best. Absolutely. I uh, just wanna say thank you, Katie. You've you brought a smile to our face every single week. So thank you for all your hard work and thanks for being such a good teammate. Um, I welcome everyone to come back every single week. Uh, we'll still be here and I hope Katie, you can still show up as well too in your first weeks over there at Flint Ridge Sacred Heart. Thank you, Katie. Now I'm unmuted. I, I just <laughs> want to thank you so much for all you did and um, good luck going forward. Thank you, Rob. And thank you. Thank you, Rob, for all you do for CEF and thank you for always being such a good friend to me. Thanks. Katie, thank you for including me. It's been a pleasure and I'll continue watching. Good. Thank oh, you, Angie. Thank you, Katie. We'll look forward to seeing you every week. Thank you. Hey, John, you yes, got a great I'm school. Committed, man. You got a great sure. school. You got great kids. Um, you guys did a great job this morning. Katie always does a great job. But, John, I just want to remind you one thing. Uh, you're doing a great job, but you know, you put up that cup earlier. And, uh, <laughs> just yes. like have a little equal time. <laughs> Got it. I, I even have toys. <laughs> Yay, Katie. <laughs> oh, thank you. You can always decorate a mug on the other side. <laughs> Pauline, That's you're great. wonderful. Keep coming. Keep coming. Oh, I will. I'm I'm sorry. I love this. This has just been a joy. Um, um, I'm always partial to Alan and Jocelyn and Mr. Rojas. Uh, you guys are an incredible group. Um, you make Catholic education um, just, you just make it pop. You're a joy to be around. Your leadership's incredible. And um, clearly the young men and women you are educating at Our Lady of Talpa is a true tribute to what you're doing at Talpa, to what your faculty and staff are doing. So Alan and Jocelyn, just hats off to you guys. Just, um, I, I like the doctor, I like the uh, game game designer or the editor, you guys are just gonna rock it. So um, we know we're gonna see great things out of you guys. Thank you everybody. Well, we're past time, but thank you guys all very much. I know it's, it's Wednesday, we have to get back to our busy days, but. I just wanna say something. You, okay. I feel like you have built, you built more community for me in the past several months than I have had with all these people. And I think I probably speak for other people. It's it's you and the magic that you brought to this that created that community. And um, this is one of the highlights of my week. And um, it really, you're bring, bringing community where we had not had this before. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Your, your gift will live on, so. Grace, keep really. coming and keep supporting us. We need all of you. And really we're, yeah, do. and Trace, oh, we're going to have you as a guest uh, coming up in, in November, yeah. I think. So next, in next a few month. weeks. 
Yeah. Right. And I'm a little nervous because Alan and Yasin did such a good job. I I'm a little intimidated. I, I don't know how you're going to follow that. <laughs> no, I was nervous. And then I saw how beautifully they did. So I think you'd speak from your heart, but um, maybe they can give me some tips. <laughs> but really, uh, really, Katie, I think everyone has been blessed by these, these hours. They're really incredible. Bye. Bye, Katie. Thanks, Katie. Thank you. Thank you.